All right, let's get into this. So um, I have the great privilege of kicking us off this year. Honestly, it's a privilege. It's an honor. I'm going to be speaking over the next two weeks. And um, we're starting this year with this incredible vision that Dan talked about. Um, one, if you've got one of these, it's on the back. One people, one passion, one purpose that the world may know. And, and many of you will know that this scripture is taken from John uh, 17, this incredible prayer that Jesus prays unto his Father and is recorded in the book of John. And it's this beautiful insight both into the connection and relationship and intimacy shared between Jesus and his Father, but also Jesus' desire for us to know him in, a, in, in that way. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it real quick just to kick us off with it. John 17 verse 20, it says this. This is Jesus praying to his dad. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Verse 21, that they may all be one, Father, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I'm going to read it again. John 17, verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Talking about the disciples. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. And I'm I'm going to talk more about that scripture specifically next week um, because I was digging into it and I was kind of buying it a chomp to share about it. And then it struck me that I'm speaking to you on the first Sunday of the month and the first Sunday of the year. And there's this opportunity to stop for a second and make this decision collectively to make God first in our life once again as we kick off 2017. I know that sounds cliche. I know that's very easy to say, but... If we actually do it, this year will be different because of it. So I'm going to dive into John 17 next week um, because this moment, this Sunday is foundational. It's a, it's, it's a foundational moment. We have a choice right now about how we begin building for the next year. We can make a decision today which defines the next 365 days. 65, yeah. 365 days. And that's really powerful. Today's a foundational day. How do we build from today? And what do we build from today? And what do we build upon? So I'm going to be talking about foundations. I'm going to be talking about what we're building on and what we're building. My my, my message today, the talk title is, What Are You Made Of? So let's get into the scriptures. We're going to go from uh, Ephesians 2 and start uh, verse 14. Ephesians 2 verse 14. Now, let's get a little bit interactive. This... um. In this passage, uh, Paul mentions the word one four times. And I want you to read along with me. And when we reach the word one, I'm going to throw up the one. And I want you all collectively in our first act of oneness and unity this year to say it with me really loud and really proud. One. Are you with me? Have you got your Bibles open? Maybe. Okay, let's do this. So verse 14, Ephesians 2, one in Christ. For he himself, this is Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, verse 16, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility, verse 17. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, Jesus that is, through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. I'm going to carry on reading. I just want to pause for a minute and give you some context. This is Paul, one of the main writers of the New Testament, one of the first apostles, right into the church in Ephesus. And uh, he's dealing, in in this moment, he's dealing with this dualism within the church, this division between two people, Jews and Gentiles. And he's expressing to them the unity that he so desires for them to live in, that so God's heart for them to live in, both as Jews and Gentiles. And he's challenging this thought pattern inside the mind of the Jews, which is, we are God's people. We have arrived here through obedience, through keeping the law, through a steadfast relationship with Yahweh. 
And now these Gentiles are presuming they can have the same access to the God that our forefathers have served with such religious ritual and ordinances for centuries. How could that be? And this wall, as Paul puts it, of hostility and division is being built between them. And he's seeking to challenge it. Why? Because God's desire to see oneness in his body then and now is his greatest and most principal means of declaring his love, declaring his nature to the world. Let me say that one more time. God's desire for oneness, for unity, for a collective peace and belonging and sharing between us as the body of Christ is his principal means of revealing himself in his nature and his love to the rest of the world. Why? Because through the cross, through the outpouring of Christ's body and his blood, through his sacrifice, access was made for every single person, regardless of where you've come from and who you are, to sit at a table of God. Unity in the body represents a belief in the power of the cross to bring two people from two different places to the same location because of nothing they did to earn it, nothing they did to deserve it. Are you with me? God's desire for oneness between us in the spirit is his means of reaching the world. I'm going to talk about that more next week, but that's, um, that's pretty powerful. He has reconciled us as a people through his cross. He's reconciled us as a people through his sacrifice. Our unity, Paul's saying, the unity between the two of you is the evidence of your belief, your individual belief that Jesus is enough. What brings hostility and what brings division into the church? And I'm talking about a church not as a building or an organization, but as a people. What brings division into the church is when we begin to linger on the words of the enemy that says, you arrived here through your own self-significance, through your own works, and through your own means. Therefore, you begin building this case about yourself and against someone else, which benches grace for a moment. It says, I arrived here because of, as the Jews said, what I've done, how I've worked for this. In the the case of Ephesians, he's dealing with circumcision. Because of a physical act, I have a right to be here that you don't have. But the thing about grace is it creates a level playing field. Everyone sat at the table of God, arrived in the same way. We were all broken beggars, ragamuffins who broke every commandment by Tuesday, but collapsed into the arms of a God, we all discovered that we couldn't outrun. And so Paul is challenging the mindset in the Jews, like he does in Galatians when he rebukes Peter. Why are you acting like you got here by some means other than grace? Oneness in the body is evidence that you believe the cross is enough for you and you and you and you, whether right now you're Sikh, Muslim, atheist, agnostic, it doesn't matter, Jew, Gentile. It's the idea that um, you arrived here through your own strength that creates the us and them mentality. My nation is better than your nation. That creates the walls of hostility that some take very literally, instead of breaking them. Let me read that first script, that first verse again. It's just really powerful. For he, Im- for he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down, ready? He has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by how? Abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, which means religious ritual. There is nothing you could do to make God love you more. There's nothing you could do to make God love you less. The best thing that you can do to express his nature is give up and allow your success in him to be totally credited to grace. Suddenly, Jews and Gentiles become very similar. Amen. Let's carry on real quick. See, verse 19 continues. So then, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, Those beggars, ragamuffins, broken people have become fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God. Wow. Verse 20. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. I didn't tell Andy what I was going to preach on this morning. So I just love that we sung that song. 
21, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22, in him you are also being built together, this is us, into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. I believe that this year God is inviting us to truly believe that we can become a mobile, very real, very tangible, very accessible temple of his presence and of his dwelling that represents his peace and his love and his joy and his desperation for reconciliation between himself and the Lord. This house is full of temples. You are a temple. Paul says in Corinthians, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You are not your own. You are a temple of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to talk about that more next week. But this temple that you are must be raised, must be built upon the foundation, which is Christ, the cornerstone. Over Christmas, I was hanging out with my family, obviously, and my brother-in-law is a building surveyor. He's a very, very intelligent guy. He could have done anything with his life. Man, this guy could have been a doctor. He could have been a lawyer. But he chose to go into buildings and going, going into buildings and evaluating them and working out where their weaknesses is and where their strength is and consulting with companies and telling them how to build what they want to achieve in the best way. And so I said to him, with no agenda for, for it to be a spiritual conversation, I said to him, Ed, talk to me about foundations in terms of a building. Talk to me about foundations. This was on my heart. And, and so he did. I'm going to read you word for word what he said. And I want you to, I want you to know that he wasn't writing for me just to slot this into a preach. This isn't his spiritual, you know, paraphrase or proverb on building surveying. This is him just talking very practically about the point of a foundation. Without foundations, any building would lack structural integrity. And ultimately, this would lead to failure. Foundations are not generic. They are specific to the building and conditions they are built in. So the greater the building, the greater the requirement for foundations. The greater the building, the greater the requirement for foundations. They are specifically and intentionally designed. Foundations come at a great cost. Whew. Think about that. Foundations come at a great cost and can be a large part of the budget at any build, but are always the starting block and the very first thing built. And then in my notes, I had written, before he gave me that, I'd written this, you know, I just kind of looked it up. And even in ancient, you know, first century building principles, the first stone that was laid was the cornerstone. It's the most um, thought through and carefully constructed stone in the building process. It carries the weight. It carries the whole structure upon itself. But when Ed sent me this, man, this was fresh revelation. Let me just pick out the one bit which really spoke to me. The greater the building, the greater requirement for foundations. Who wants to have a great 2017? Who wants to have a year, and I mean this, of fulfilled promises and, and fulfilled desires and dreams and expectations and hopes? Put up your hand. In fact, who wants to be a powerful, and I mean this in a humble and, you know, dying to self manner, but who wants to be a great person? Not in their own eyes, but in the eyes of the Lord. Who wants to be a great person? Come on. We need great foundations. We need to have great foundations. And we live in an age which is far more concerned with features than foundations. We're far more aware of what's above the surface than what's below it, right? We're far more aware of what catches your eye and your attention initially rather than what's holding the whole thing together. Let me talk about that practically for a minute. Well, if it feels good, do it. If it feels right, if it's not harming anyone, do it. If you feel so lured and um, taken by a feature of something, that's the, begin, that's the language we begin to use. I've done it myself. So concerned and so aware of how attractive something seems in its design or in its initial experience, whether that's a, it could be anything. It could be a, a relationship. It could be a job. It could be absolutely anything. And we begin to have this very passive language, which is, well, if it feels good, do it. 
and it, it's, it's totally feature-based, but this is the language of our culture. And as a millennial, I mean, I'm guilty of it more than anyone and being a part of it where we're so consumed and impressed with the features of something and so utterly unconcerned with its foundations. Yes, but what is it built upon? What does that feature adhere to? What is that feature actually in submission of? I I learned the, the cost of overvaluing features and undervaluing foundations in the first year of my marriage. Um, I'm going to tell you the story real quick. As I, I've, I've mentioned this before, but Cara and I were living, we got married, we lived in a room. The front door and the bathroom door. Kitchen, lounge, everything, bedroom, all in one room. And um, it was snug, you know. And it, there were some funny moments. We started a record label three minutes, three minutes, three months into our marriage. It was pretty much three minutes in. Um, Cara had no idea what she was getting involved with. And um, there would be nights where she was asleep and I would, be, I would be like making beats on the keyboard. <laughs> and she's lying in bed in the same room like, shut up. <laughs> and um, there was nowhere to go, you know, nowhere to run. And um, we began thinking, man, it would be kind of nice to get another place. It would be kind of nice to get somewhere bigger. We were broke. We couldn't really afford anything more. We had like, we were paying like 500 pounds a month and in Bath that gets you a nice shoebox. So we're kind of in the shoebox market um, but we, we, we were kind of desiring a bigger place. And so anyway, I, I would spend some time on, on Gumtree looking at flats and looking at, looking at houses and seeing if anything popped up. And one day, I see this house. It's this apartment. And um, it's, it's on Pony Bridge. It's overlooking the river. It's incredible. It's two bedrooms. It's got a huge open plan living room, kitchen. It's fully furnished. Like, the features of this place were incredible. I'm not even joking, Steph. You'd appreciate it. The, the couches were amazing. The rugs were amazing. It was already a go. And in my head, I'm like, there's no point even looking at the price. This is going to be 2,000 pounds or up. And I looked at it, and it was 550 pounds per month. Two bedrooms, massive, fully furnished. And I was like, I, I'm a top language influencer, very high intensity. So I was like, babes, I found it. You know, um, and then... Saw the, saw the email of, of um, the, the uh, landlord, and so I jumped on it straight away. The listing had gone up that day. I wrote to him. I said, hey, mate, um, this place looks amazing. My wife and I want it. Car hadn't even seen it yet. We can move in today. Um, t- let us know the details. And to be honest, I, I assumed there was a catch of some sort. You know, does he live there? Um, and, and so I, I said, I said, you know, it, it seems incredibly cheap for, for an apartment in the center of town. So What's the deal? And he wrote back instantly. He said, hey, my name is Dan. Um, I'm, uh, I live in, in, in Amsterdam. And this is the catch. I'll be honest with you. This is the catch. I can only let, let it out for six months at a time because I, I, I uh, might have to come back. So the catch is you don't know if you're going to be there beyond six months. So that's why it's cheap. Just kind of want to get someone in there. It's likely you could keep rolling the contract, but I may well be back. Um, I wrote back and I said, well, you know, six months in paradise is better than six months elsewhere. So I'm down. And, um, and you know, and just said, let's get, let's get this going. How much is the deposit? He said, it'll be 500 pounds deposit plus first and last month's rent. So 1,500 up front. Um, and I was like, okay, yeah, I'm good for the money. Three pounds 60 in my bank account, but I'm good for the money. I'll find it. And um, so get on the phone with my dad. Hey, dad, found a place. Two bedrooms. That means you and mom can visit. This is a really good deal for you guys. I know that you want to come at Bath. So um, the, the, the situation is, Dad, um, needs some cash uh, pronto. Uh, so how about we work out a deal? I'll pay you back monthly. Uh, but we could do with, you know, the best part of a thousand pounds, basically, to get this place. But honestly, Dad, like, you know, I'm an influencer. I'm a, I, I can sell stuff. Like, this is a good deal for you, Dad. Um, and so anyway, we talk it through and it's like, actually, you know what? This is really good. This is going to be really good for us. We can pay the money back. Uh, it's all going to be cool. And I'm, at this point, you know, I'm really excited. And I get another email from the guy, and he's like, okay, look, I've had a bunch of interest, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll agree to come over in the next few days, meet with you, show you the place, um, give you a full tour around. If you're absolutely down for it, then we'll do it. We'll sign and give you the keys there and then. And I'm elated, you know. He, he, he says, look, to, to make it worth my time, and, and, and I'm going to be putting money down on plane to get the plane over from Amsterdam, what I need from you is this. 
Obviously, I'm not going to ask you to transfer any money. That would be ludicrous. Um, I could just rob you. But what I am going to ask for is just proof that you have the money um, so that when I come over, I know that it's going to be worth my time. All I need you to do is this. Um, go into Western Union, make a deposit. Don't transfer anything. Make a deposit, 1,500 pound deposit, and then send me the proof of the deposit. Then what will happen, I'll come over to Bath. We'll view the place. If you like it, I'll give you the keys. We'll go to Western Union together. And then because it's you who's made the deposit, you give the ID, you'll get the money, you'll give it to me, all good. And I'm like, very well thought through, my friend. Sounds great. And um, so at this point, I'm like, this is a done deal. This is absolutely amazing. I'm at work. I'm working in super dry. Um, my dad's going to transfer the money. We've got a payment plan set up to pay him back. I'm feeling great. Um, I'm now in influencer mode. I'm texting everyone, sending them pictures. This is the new pad. We're going to have a housewarming next week. Um, we're going to have a party the week after. This is, you know, me and Car in a new season. Honey and milk, Canaan, here we come. And, um, and everyone's texting back, like, this is amazing. Look at that place, man. This is awesome, you know. It's fully furnished. Look at these features. Look at that kitchen. Look at the couch. This is amazing. And people are excited. Like, this is awesome. We've just got married. We haven't got a lot of money. We're going to have an amazing place. Then I text James Horsfall. Is James Horsfall in the house? No, okay. He's out for brunch. Um, I text James. I'm like, James, dude, I'm moving to this place, man. What do you think? Send him the photos. He texts back, dude, this looks incredible. Like amazing. So I'm at work. It, the, the clock's ticking. Uh, I get off at 3 p.m. I'm going to, dad's transferred the money. I'm going to go straight to Western Union, do the deal then. I'm pumped. The clock's ticking. It's like 2 p.m. James texts me back. He says, Josh, the floor plans. I text him back, what about the floor plans, James? And he says, uh, they don't match. What do you mean? He says, well, the picture of the kitchen and the lounge is bigger than the floor plan's dimension. Josh, this isn't the same place. The floor plan and the pictures don't match. What? My heart starts racing a little bit. He's like, either there's a mess up on error and they've put the wrong floor plans in, or you're being scammed, man. And I'm like, no, 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 what are you talking about? So anyway, I don't text him back. I, I text my best mate, Google, and I just say, I need some advice. I'm just going to give you a few words. Give me your wisdom. Gumtree, flat, Western Union, scam. <laughs> and I put it in. Do, 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 do. The search results are crazy, starting with BBC. Hundreds of students have been scammed this year through uh, people posing as landlords, living in different parts of Europe, offering luxury accommodation for an incredibly low price. The way they're doing this is asking people to transfer uh, a, a, a document that proves they've made a deposit to Western Union. Now, you can't collect that money in Western Union without having ID, but the fact you've got the deposit slip means really you just need to have some, you know, 80% good enough fake ID to get in there and do it, and they'll probably give you it, or at least they had done. And there was, uh, it was Chelsea, it was York, it was Oxford, it was Cambridge, it was Bath. And my heart sunk. It's like, man. So I wrote to him, are we being scammed? <laughs> he didn't reply. Um, so, you know, sent the money back to my dad, went home, said, babes, enjoy the palace for a little longer. But I learned something. When you make a decision where you prioritize features over foundations. Now, I'm going to say something. I'm going to explain it. You lay down your convictions to take up your desires. What I mean by that is this. There's a saying which says the devil's in the detail, right? And I learned it that day. Unless you see the plans, you don't know you're being scammed. If all you've seen is the features, you haven't seen the foundations, you give yourself to lack, and it's often done out of a place where you're trying to escape a certain circumstance or disappointment. I wanted to get out of that flat so bad, I didn't even see it. It was there the whole time. But I'm so grateful for James Horsfall. I'm so grateful that he questioned the foundations against the features. Josh, this looks great, but what about the foundations? It doesn't match. And James, and I, I wish he was here. I want to honor him. Hopefully he'll come at night. But I, I, 
the, the reason it's so powerful is James has done that for me in my life, as has many other brothers and sisters. I've got this idea. I'm going to do this. That sounds amazing. Would that feature match up with a foundation, which is Jesus? Or are you having a bench Jesus to make this decision or to even emotionally process whether you should do it? God, could you step out of the room for a second? I need to make a decision. He wants to be your foundation and your cornerstone, the crux of every decision, the, the basis of every motive. Are you with me? And I learned something that day. When we choose features over foundations, we lay down our convictions to take up our desires. And this passage is so powerful because Paul's saying, with Christ as our cornerstone and only with Christ as your cornerstone, only with Christ as your conviction, but with him there as your foundation, you can become this holy, blameless, beautiful, perfect temple within which the whole presence of God chooses to dwell. But without that foundation, you cannot. He won't build a temple that's not on himself. And some of us are trying to live a life which has the features of a temple without the foundations of a temple. Trying to live and act like this perfect and pure dwelling place of God without building your life around it. And I know I've been there, but I'm starting this year saying, God, you can take the features. I don't want them. I want to be a foundation. I want to be a temple built on you, God. I want to be a temple built on the knowledge and the truth that it's Christ or nothing. If Christ gave you everything, no one owes you anything. Amen. Either the cross accomplished everything or it accomplished nothing. And I believe it conquered everything. Amen. Peter the apostle quoted Isaiah in, in Peter 1, 2, he, 1, 1 Peter chapter 2. He quotes Isaiah from Isaiah 28 and it says this. For it stands in Scripture. Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. I'm going to declare this over every single one of you right now. The Lord says, Behold, I am laying in you a stone a cornerstone chosen and precious and whoever believes in him Jesus will never be put to shame will never be put to shame if you want to begin this year living shame free fear free doubt free and when I say doubt I mean in question of the power of the cross, in question of whether the cross really accomplished what we believe in this house it did. Then we must begin this year with an assurance and a conviction that Christ is our cornerstone. Let's stand together and let's pray. We're going to sing this song again because I had no idea. I had no idea that Andy was going to sing it. Um, And... There's something on it. That's all I can say. There's something on this song. And so we're going to end like this today, my friends. If you've come this morning and it's your first time hearing this stuff, maybe you're here with a friend. Maybe you're here um, just because you've walked off the street this morning. We're getting that a lot more often these days. I just want to remind you of this this word that Paul shares in, in the scriptures. He says, let me just find this first. So then, verse 19, you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints, the members of the household of God. I want to say over all of you right now, you are no longer a stranger, but you are being invited this morning to become a member of the household of God, a saint, a citizen among saints. If you want to know fully what it meant, when Jesus hung on that tree, on that cross that you've grown up seeing, then we'd love to talk to you more about it. About this king who climbed off his throne and onto a Roman torture device. 
he that had no sin became our sin so that we could become his righteousness we believe in a gospel which isn't about a transaction it's about transformation we are a changed people in this room amen come on so we're going to sing this song i'm going to pray and we're going to sing this song and um let go if you need to let go give up if you need to give up make a decision today to build different this year to build upon Jesus, to build upon his foundations, to get into this this library of books this year. Today, I dare you begin it. Oh, leave it off the stage. I do that every time. <laughs> there's, there's apps, there's, there's Bible plans where you can read this whole library in one year. It's such a good move. Start it today, read it, consume it, eat it all day, all year. Thank you, Father. Lord, I thank you that with you, the story's never over. Father, I thank you that with you, there is always more to discover. There is always more of you, Father. And Lord, we begin today. You can raise up your hand if you want to. Lord, we begin today by saying, Father, I, let's say it together. Father, I choose to build my life upon Jesus the cornerstone, the foundation, my provision, and everything I need. Jesus, we say to you this morning that you are enough. And Holy Spirit, we honor you amongst us. Come and have your way. Move amongst us this year. We love you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Let's make some noise for the King. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.